Hello everybody and welcome back to the Enterprise Dish. It is that time of the month where we're talking Windows, which means Aaron from Smart Deploy is hanging out with us today. How is it going up in there? And hopefully, well, I guess it is Seattle, so you never know if it really is sunny. Yeah, it's uh, it's been in and out and it's going actually really nice at the moment, partly cloudy. I can see all my windows here and uh, still unseasonably cool, but um, yeah, I guess I would say average March weather in Seattle. We'll take it. Yeah, average is is pretty good. It's uh, it's finally warming up here in the Midwest. Or, and, uh, uh, we're well, we're hitting a, a very comfortable fifty degrees today. I think tomorrow it's supposed to get closer to sixty, but it is uh, it's warming up. I'm hoping I'm hoping we're done with the snow at least for a little bit. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about Seattle as well. And we had flurries last week and, you know, the sort of craziness continues on some level, which is why a, a, an average uh, Seattle day is, is welcome these days. But, um, yeah, things are things are things are clicking along. Seems sure. like a, a flu flu bug maybe is going around. I don't know if, if you're seeing that where you are, yep, but absolutely are. Actually, my mother was, was out with it. Yeah, yeah, it really was. It's usually like a January, early February thing, and it's it's hitting hard now. Yeah, yeah, so. all kinds of people wiped out. My daughter plays club volleyball, and everyone got sick, but they all they were too sick to play, but still went and hung out and watched the games. Mm -hmm. um, which of course then got more people sick, and so it's just poor <laughs> judgment central. So. Yeah, maybe we can pick it back up at the end of uh, the discussion, but man, yeah, it's kind of kind of brutal. Yeah, and there's on the Windows side, there's there's been a lot of news. Um, we never know what we're gonna get because we do these things monthly, and sometimes there's not a whole lot going on. But this is not one of those months. Uh, first up with Patch Tuesday, Microsoft announcing that they fixed 64 vulnerabilities. But the key here is that they patched two zero days, one on Windows 7 and one on Windows 10. Yeah, I didn't hear. I, I didn't get too much detail on what the nature of those zero days was, and I don't know if you if you dug into it a ton. A little um, bit, just but just a smidgen. Yeah, I mean the thing. The interesting thing is, it comes out in parallel with some of these other update management capabilities of being able to pause updates mm -hmm. and, um, and then the other one of kind of the auto rollback of updates, which yeah. kind of seems to fly in the face of this notion that you have zero day security mm -hmm. problems. So a good point. I don't know. It's kind of a bit of a head scratcher, but they also don't want to repeat sort of the big problem of uh, of the the updates that delete files. So it you know you got to kind of pick your poison, I guess. Yeah, it, one of them was actually I believe the Windows Seven was reported by Google. It actually started out I believe as a flaw in Chrome, and then that gave you elevated per, uh, permissions in Windows, and then you could kind of dig deeper from there. But everything should be patched. But to your point. That uh, the other thing, one of the things Microsoft announced this week is on Windows 10, and and this is one of those baffling features that you would think they would have maybe made available, I don't know, two decades ago. But if, right. you, if you install an update and your system fails to boot or hangs or whatever, the, the OS in most scenarios, it says, uh, will be able to claw back that update, you know, remove it from your system, and then hopefully you should have a good clean boot, which makes you wonder why it took so long for this to, to roll out. You're right. And and how is it? OK, so so the, the reason the basis for this mm -hmm. is is sound. OK, so we yep. have quality problems and we're moving faster and we have these twice yearly updates, which contains a, a varying basket of goodies. And in between, we have patches still with, a, a, as you pointed out accurately, another varying basket of goodies. And at any point, given the diversity of devices, um, anything could go wrong and mm -hmm. you should have the ability to roll back. And we have other colorful words that we use, uh, as I'm <laughs> sure many other of our listeners use to describe that, that rollback. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you, 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 you want to be able to do that. And I think, I think a, a number of us probably have those techniques, right? The, the, the approaches that we have, our product smart deploy does some of that too. And then part of the beauty of it is, especially at a driver level, we, you know, we try to kind of make that not a problem. That's the reason a lot of people like our stuff, but it, it's a bit of a, you know, a head scratcher to me that, that this still kind of persists, that they haven't tried to get to the yep. source of some of these problems. You know what I mean? That, that, that there's not sort of a, a parallel effort to, to solve that. But in the same mm -hmm. breath, you know, I'm still sort of this advocate and a believer in the impossibility of this job of making windows in the first place. Yeah. So it's sort of it's sort of a lot a lot at once, but it's it's a good feature to have. I think it's beneficial. It's going to make good things happen for a lot of people. 
I think because this now exists, it's a bit of a nod to IT professionals to say, look, you, you got to think about your own strategies to address this. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe in your lab test the way that some of this works. Right. I mean, but the thing about it too, is based on what I've read, I've not played with the feature at all is that you don't necessarily choose. It's that if, if you reboot and it goes poorly, then windows does its magic thing. Isn't yep. that right? Is that, was that how you understood it? Mm -hmm. So then you're, you're kind of leaving your trust in windows to make this go, which is, yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> your, your, your average it pro, I don't know. I don't know how, what our it'd be, it'd be interesting to get some listener feedback mm -hmm. to say, Oh yeah. And, I, I would I would trust that all day long. It would save me a headache. I think our our team, so not only not only the 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 product engineering team would have a different opinion, but our IT people themselves would have a very different opinion, yep. which is I would never leave it up to the operating system. Mm -hmm. So but but then what do you do? Right? right. Do you do flatten and reload and just re-image? I mean, that's what many organizations do. You know, many enterprise mm -hmm. organizations where You've got IT help desk has a very limited and very precise window to get you back up and running. And if you don't, it's flatten and reload. Yep. So you get habituated to some of those practices that are de facto best practices, but they, there are probably better ways to do it. So maybe this is an opportunity to reinvent a new or better best practice uh, in this ever evolving landscape of dealing with Windows. when I when I wrote this up, uh, I got an email from a, a listener and they they had a better headline. I should have gone gone with it, but they, what they called this they said Patch Tuesday just take out an insurance policy. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yes. was like that's 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 a good way to put it. I mean, that's what it is okay. effectively. Indeed, indeed, it is, and 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 shouldn't it? Shouldn't shouldn't you always have the ability to mm -hmm. just roll that back? And, and it's almost, uh, it almost gives you these VM like capabilities of snapshotting and, yep. um, and things like that, which, you know, to me seems like something every operating system should have, right? It, yep. it, it, honestly, it seems like a very practical, um, thing that, that should exist for, for these, uh, you know, non, non virtualized, non hypervisor based operating systems. If you're running on a hardware, why can't you have the same flexibility and, um, um, you know, portability as well. And some of those things. And in fact, you know, going back to what we're, we're doing, that's sort of what we're trying to accomplish is, is providing some of that, um, to people who run, you know, conventional desktops. And another, another interesting point is, is these milestones they're hitting, right? Is it, mm -hmm. uh, 800 million, uh, windows yep, 10 desktops, exactly I think what it is. You, you mentioned that is huge. That's a ton of windows devices. So again, this notion that Windows is going to go away and, and fail and uh, and be uh, obviated by smartphones and 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 uh, and tablets is just it, it, maybe maybe decades down. But mm -hmm. you know, if if a billion people are using Windows, man, that's a that's a pretty permanent fixture. And um and and so the the, the kind of corollary to that is what's happening in the enterprise, right? And that's what we're interested. In. I think it's what a lot of our listeners are interested in. Um, and there, I think it still is the, the way to go. Um, it, it's, it's, it is the standard. And so as you think about the zero day stuff, you think about how you manage patches mm -hmm. and roll back patches and, and, and where you want your windows management to go and how you want it to be, especially in the world of windows 10, because now windows seven, there's more yep. sort of end of life news coming out around that too. Right. So yeah, it's sort of it's it's a very very interesting time in in like the very the, the, the short summary of all TLDR interesting time for Windows people you know whether you're on the administration and management side or on the dev side it's it's sort of uh, crazy time. It is. There's a there's a lot going on, and that 800 million number should I was over the past couple of weeks I've been trying to ballpark when is it going to hit a billion because that's. It's a, a milestone. I don't know if it's necessarily a monetary milestone for Microsoft because they're already getting money from software assurance and a bunch of different things. And we, we expect that most of the remaining people are probably corporate customers. But a billion numbers is a billion number. That's, that's a, big, it's a big pool of people. And so they last announced an update, I believe it was in the fall of 700 million. And they're doing somewhere between 12 to 14-ish million new Windows 10 uh, users each month which puts them somewhere in the ballpark of, uh, on the aggressive side, probably about a year. I think it's gonna depend on how quickly things ramp up for them as we approach that 2020 deadline of Windows 7. 
Sure. And I think it's also interesting to think about this in terms of the channel. And I, I, mm-hmm. I would imagine some of our listeners are, you know, in that category of, um, you know, resellers and SIs that are in there touching these devices and helping customers with these devices. And the volume is pretty amazing, right? I mean, and so this notion that, yeah, PC sales are flat, but, you know, when you reach saturation, mm-hmm. right, we, we all have a refrigerator, right? Refrigerator sales are what they are. Everyone still needs a refrigerator. Yep. And so the churn that, ha- <clears throat> excuse me, that happens relative to hardware refresh in parallel, everyone fi- finishing the, the Win 10 deployment job and what that means for people's adoption, utilization, changes in behavior with the changes in the way the operating systems work. How does that translate to the way you're using your other devices mm-hmm. in your life? Um, yeah, it's, it, it's sort of interesting to think about, but it is it is quite staggering what transpires for yep. the average, you know, reseller that does volume with these things and the, the ex- lengths they have to go to to keep, you know, the the delivery trucks filled up. And, and it's not it's a non-trivial undertaking. For you know, sure. There's so many nuances in the way that people do things. Part and parcel to this discussion about updates is if you are. Um, you know, you, you, you have VAR X who's doing your, your device management sort of new, new out of box and they're, they're Mm -hmm. imaging for you and they do all these nice things that, that the VARs do. Awesome. But in our environment, we have, you know, all these policies and we insist that it comes and, and arrives in this specific way. Awesome. Every other institution and organization has their own variation of that. And it's a put upon the VAR to manage that. So now you've got sort of these permutations of the way that Windows allows you to do things or, or requires you to do things. You have every enterprise's variation on that. And the poor VARs are sitting there trying to yep. figure it out and they're stuffing server rooms full of everyone's config servers mm-hmm. trying to get it right. They're doing everything they can to make it so that when you get the device, you're not sitting there waiting for hours or days of updates um, because then that's a security risk and all these other you know pains and challenges uh, it, it is, it is a wild time. The other crazy aspect of this are things like GDPR yep. and, uh, you know, things like that, that have all these other security ramifications that are being pushed down. And the people that are probably in, in healthcare are laughing because they've lived this with HIPAA. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but that's another whole layer to this burrito. That's just crazy. I don't know. Kind of getting in a soapbox, but no, no, no. It, it's an interesting time because it's about to get, uh, Microsoft's about to, you know, put a little more paprika on, <laughs> on, on the fire here, uh, because starting next month they're going to start rolling out when Windows XP was transitioning that we refer to as nag screens, which are effectively pop-ups that are going to say, "Hey, this product's reaching end of life. You should update." And so there's a couple big questions here. Now, granted, Microsoft claims that you're going to be able to click a button and it'll go away forever. And they'll they'll only tell you once. We'll see how well that works out in practice. But what we don't know is if what SKUs of Windows 7 this is going to hit. Because if this hits enterprise SKU, you know what's going to happen. The accountant comes in. They log into their computer and say, hey, my computer is going to be out of date here soon. They're going to pick up the phone, open a support ticket, and it's going to create hell in a handbasket for the IT pro. Yes, right. Yes, exactly. Every, Every enterprise IT professional... Who, who touches windows heads are going to explode and it's exactly. going to, so all, you know, they're, they're, this is, this is the thing is that, you know, Microsoft has to get out in front of this and over communicate like crazy and give it, you know, switches or a, a GPO to push out or something to suppress it or something, mm-hmm. right? There's gotta be some lever to pull um, because it can't just be an email because nobody reads their email. Right that says, oh, don't worry about it, dismiss it, it'll never bother you again. Moreover, think about the very large enterprises that have, you know, 100, 150,000 endpoints mm-hmm. that this is happening to, and then everyone's gonna be asking questions, multiply that by all the emails that are going. Yep. <laughs> you know, I, I like to think about things in terms of the bandwidth and storage that these little issues end up utilizing oh, in yeah. enterprise, right? I mean, is yep. this, is this, is this a, a, a hundred gig issue? Is this a terabyte issue? Just mm-hmm. in terms of the nag emails that are going to happen to yep. IT as a result of the nag screen that they're getting in Windows because, you know, they're executing according to their own plan and their own timeline, which we've talked about in past episodes of, you know, timeline, budget, dependent apps, 
um, you know, hu- human power, all these factors have to be calculated. Moreover, the migration process is not a one-time unilateral process. Very, very few organizations do it in a beginning, middle, and in a short calendar time frame. Mm-hmm. This is a, you know, kind of a phased or staged thing with many, many milestones and it's prioritized based on roles. It's prioritized based on compatibility of apps and the organizations that need to use them. You know, so maybe um, uh, legal happens first and then, you know, some, you know, other, you know, knowledge worker teams happen second and finance happens last because they have all the most sensitive apps. Mm -hmm. And so those are the last people that you want to be heckling with with these nag screens. But, you know, I understand the Microsoft position on this, too, which is, you know, we don't want we don't want the other problem, which is. You know, people get a negative surprise and they're falling off a cliff and they can't say we told you so. Right. They got to be able to say we told you so. So yep. what's the most elegant and appropriate way to do that? Yep. You know, and so if, if you have a negligent IT team and they're sleeping at not sleeping on the switch, maybe that's not fair, especially to our to our loyal listeners. But there are other priorities and you're not thinking about this as much as whatever, a database migration or a storage upgrade or swapping out a bunch of switches or, mm-hmm. you know, re, re, redeveloping, relaunching an app on, you know, or migrating to the cloud, all these really super, you know, valuable and important high priority things that we think about, you know, the we too easily assume Windows is going to keep chugging along. And, and I think it's generally a fair and safe assumption that speaks volumes to the trust we have in this thing that we, we, we joke about and make sure. fun of. But it also can come back to bite you when when these things play out this way, mm-hmm. right? There, there will be a time when yep. it, you got to put it down or it'll keep working and you just live with the consequences. Like, you know, we, we have some um, some healthcare customers that do that where they have software that's not being updated uh, by the ISV in a timely way and they have to keep running it on XP or mm-hmm. you know something even earlier in certain cases. It's laughable. So they go to extraordinary lengths to secure it properly and disconnect it and it's living in its own little isolated world and not using any uh, you know personally identifiable information. And so it's HIPAA compliant and they're doing acrobatics to support one system yep. you know that IT hates, but they have no choice. Right. Yep. I mean and so that's that's the other thing to think about. It, it, there's, there's a lot of considerations, and I think you did a, a wonderful job of just hitting on um, what actually happens when just a minor little screen pops up. It seems relatively harmless until you start putting in the, the supply chain of what that kicks off. So, <laughs> Yeah, runaway problem, right? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, our... our... Yeah, I've got friends who who describe it as as thermal runaway, right? Like like what happened in, in an engine or something, and yep. and that's exactly the issue. And the extent to which you can preempt or avoid those problems, you should. But sometimes you can't, and and you know, so so things in in those cases, sort of that notion of the fail safe and that automatic rollback or clawback of the update becomes a really desirable feature, a really nice feature to have. Yeah. Um, you know, it might and might return people to productivity. It might also might also expose you to some security issues, but you know that's better than being completely out potentially, right? Yeah. So, so what else is happening in your world? What's going on up in the the wonderful world of smart deploy lately? We haven't caught up on what you know what's actually happening behind the walls that uh, you're sitting in front. Of. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, it, it's it's pretty interesting, really. I mean, it's been very very busy for us lots and lots of new customers uh, and thanks for any of our customers who are listening um we are moving down this road uh, and it's kind of part and parcel of the discussion we've been having of really making smart deploy manage physical endpoints as though they were vms hmm. giving giving you really sort of this vdi style management capability but for a windows thick client and making it kind of layered out and really delivering on this promise, but not requiring mega infrastructure, net new hardware investments, all, all the things, you know, more storage, uh, you know, faster network to overcome latency mm-hmm. issues. That's that's sort of the beauty of, of this approach. And there are other people who've 
you know, attempted this, um, and, and some of them relied on hypervisors and, and have had some, some problems, things have, you know, kind of gone away. Mm-hmm. Um, VMware, uh, end of life, uh, the, um, Mirage product, which was an acquisition by a company called Winova. That was really, really a brilliant, um, idea and was just, I think ultimately for the enterprise, just a little too gnarly in terms of the infrastructure it took and the, the, the management overhead to deliver on that. Right, we saw Mocha Five go away. Kind of a similar layered approach. We're fortunate that we've, you know, and maybe unfortunate, fallen down a handful of times trying to figure out how to drive into that model without having it be too robust. And I guess part of the advantage is our failures were relatively small in comparison, and that allowed the cloud to mature to a point that we can capitalize on a more mature cloud infrastructure where where it's relevant and where people want to use it to really reduce the cost of delivering it this way. So so that's what we're 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 working on is application delivery, mm-hmm. um, which will lead to patch delivery. In order to do that, you have to have asset management. But it's all playing out with this backdrop of doing it like VDI um, in layers but back-ended by your cloud of choice. So you're using the storage that you already are paying for. So no additional cost as far ah, as the way it works, okay. right? So that is the that, kicker. I, I was so waiting I'm for the, the key. The and then when you say, okay, that makes that makes a lot of sense then. Right, so we tried we tried to do this the, the brute force way and say, okay, we're gonna do everything cloud native and cloud first and you just have this nice magical subscription and away it goes and people did not wanna pay for it. They're like, no, man, mm-hmm. we've already, we've got cloud storage, we've got, you know, box.com and we've got, um, you know, all the, all the other trimmings, right? We've got office 365. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we, we've got that taken care of. Why are we going to pay you again for more cloud storage? We have too much cloud storage. And so it was like, oh, okay, interesting. Hmm. Okay. They don't want to, they don't want to roll out infrastructure locally. They don't want to buy the cloud. They kind of expect it to be free. How do we make this go? And so that was when it was like, okay, these features are extremely important. These consumption models are important. We finally just put two and two together, and and now that's that's increasingly what customers are going to see is this mode of delivery and this mm-hmm. way of of consuming this that you can back end it with whatever you prefer. You front end it with the devices you like, and we you know cater to I don't even know what the number is now. Lots, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Windows compatible devices exactly so that you don't have to use hopefully ever the automatic windows update clawback feature so that device drivers are never a problem and your apps are always up to date and even on the fly driver updates um prescribed by the oem so it's sort of a a brave new world of doing you know the Altera system center universe of management, but delivered and consumed the modern cloud way, right? I mean, there was a great turning point with um, small business uh, accounting when, you know, QuickBooks was the way you went and you threw down Mm -hmm. your $159 and you were good until you bought your next $159 license. And then Xero and FreshBooks came out and blew everybody's minds and it was so convenient and easy and did more and never went away, always up to date, always adding new features. Well, that seemed like a good idea. Intuit, very excellent company, has certainly caught up and made QuickBooks Online excellent and perfectly capable. Um, but no one's really done that for Windows. We're, we're kind of scratching our head as to why. And so that's sort of the opportunity we see in the path we're charging down. And, and you could argue that some of these things that we're talking about today mm-hmm. kind of support and validate that. That, hey, there's there's room for this and space for this. And, um, you know, certainly there's a, a growing impatience and intolerance with the way that the status quo management of old for Windows devices uh, and Windows operating systems in general, whether it's server or uh, client, um, has worked and is working. So that's that's what's interesting. And I think it's not just us too, Brad, right? I mean, I think that we're going to see more and more people. And and I think a lot of our listeners probably have devised things like this on their own, just said piecemeal it. Okay, yes, great. System Center, we got a license for it. We'll do you know, this part of it with that, because we get that and we know how to do that and we Mm -hmm. know it works reliably and we're going to keep using whatever we've got ghost or, um, you know, smart deploy for imaging. And then we'll, um, you know, do all our backend storage with box and we'll do all the content management and standardize on that. 
and and how, how do you kind of remove those uh, those pillars or those silos? You know, I mean, that's a key question and, and simplify this, simplify, simplify, simplify. And without adding cost, that's the other problem, of yeah, course, right? It's the runaway subscription problem. So very interesting time. Yeah, you can get buried in subscriptions, um, even as a, a consumer and especially as a corporate user, because you can you can sub out everything you want. Uh, you just got to be careful. Yes. And so it's interesting you bring that up because this was the first year. So, you know, as the CEO, you look at all of the dollars and where they're coming from and where they're going. And um, the the subscription line item does not appear at, on the same line item in the budget as software used to, mm -hmm. as software assets. And so it was the first year that I saw this really big subscription number across all the things that we do, right? Mm -hmm. um, do kind of a more robust ERP system. Um, that that's manual, all our CRMs online now, um, you know, the marketing automation systems, all our Azure stuff is, is adding up to a fair amount of sure. money. So all told now, wow, it is, it is a brave new world, but you know, the benefits for us certainly are there. And it's mm -hmm. a matter of staying on top of that as well. Uh, funny kind of parallel story. I was talking to a buddy uh, who actually used to work on the windows team phenomenal designer, brilliant, uh, individual. And, uh, he, you know, had an Xbox and loved it. And, and after a while kind of got, you know, stopped playing console games and, but was using it to watch whatever, you know, mm -hmm. videos and stuff, you know, um, streaming video and, um, and then TVs improved and he just watched it through the TVs app and whatever. And, so he wasn't really using his Xbox anymore, but I'll be darned if he didn't realize one day that he'd been still paying for his Xbox Live Gold subscription for like oh, two yep. years, right? Just just the credit card just kept getting hit and it was just kind of clicking along. And I think we all have examples of that. Oh, sure. In our lives, right? Yep. It's You sign up for credit monitoring because everything gets hacked apart and then you realize <laughs> that, oh, you get credit monitoring for free, but you're still paying for it. It happens to all of us eventually. Yep. So. Yeah interesting times ahead that's uh, as we run up to build here which is going to be what we're about two months yeah yeah about two months away from build which should have a lot of good stuff and actually Definitely. it's going to bring me up to your neck of the woods but before yes. we before we get on the airplanes and fly up there what do you got for the dish this week what else is going on outside the world of rolling back updates and deploying <laughs> Windows 10. I mean, uh, you know, the, the snow report is that it's continued to be a really great season, but we've talked about snow a bunch. And so I, I had all these great ideas. Oh, yes. Yes. I want to talk about wearables. I want to talk uh. about wearable devices because I was so resistant to this and, you know, feeling for so long invaded by mm -hmm. all the tech in my life and the fact that I can't put my phone down and Mm -hmm. You know, don't track my location, but where am I again? And, yeah. you know, this whole conundrum of the convenience, but the concern and it's equally privacy as well as just annoyance. Right. I yep. mean, it's not like, I, do I, do I think that, you know, big brother is watching? Of course, big brother is definitely watching, of course, but you know, do I mind wh what do I have to lose? I don't really think all that much, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got a lot of protection in place. I feel comfortable with my security situation. What is what is my real concern? Well, I broke down and went and got myself. Um, I'm an Android guy. Um, I think a lot of probably our listeners are. I'd be curious. That'd be another interesting listener feedback thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I prefer it because it feels more like a like a, a geek guy's kind it's, of it's the window it's the windows of the smart i mean if we don't have windows mobile anymore i mean it's if you like windows and the tinkering android is by far the way to go yes exactly a little more configurable right you can get under the hood and i, I want it this way i want it that way the other thing is on phone too is the widgets are just can't be beat so for me awesome tool of choice so i i'm, I'm going down the road of the android wearables um and i got a watch and i was dubious Mm -hmm. uh, and I've had it for about 30 hours and I am enamored. I love it. Yep. I can't believe it. Why did I wait so long? And it's, it's like kind of a newer gen. And so the app store isn't as built out as I'd like it to be. There are a couple of things I expected to be there that aren't a little bit of a disappointer, not enough of a disappointer that it's going back though. Yeah. I'm keeping this thing and I can't wait to try everything. You know, I don't know if I'll, you know, get into all the steps and reps thing and all mm -hmm. that. I, I, I kind of, I don't know. I kind of have a different MO. 
about that. You know, I ride a bicycle. I don't have a, a, a computer on my bike. I, I kind of just don't want to know. Yeah. You know, I kind of want to just look around for a change and not not be staring at advice. But boy, this whole notion of uh, you know the the notifications coming to the watch, staring at my watch is sometimes just better than staring at my phone. You know, yep. it's just another thing to look at. That's a nice welcome change. So I don't know I, where, where where do you stand on that, Brad? I mean, are oh, you, I'm do, a big you I, watch. Yeah, yeah I, the, I have an app, so I'm on the Apple side because that's what uh -huh. my wife uses and it's just easier. But um, sure. the the big I, I was very hesitant from a different perspective of putting of getting an LTE enabled watch. Uh huh. But I finally did in late last year, so I've had it for a couple months now, and it is it's very much along the same lines. It, I like it a lot more because when we go out for a walk with the dog, or I go running, or I do whatever, I can leave my phone at home, knowing that in an emergency I can still be get caught up. You know, somebody can call me. It's not going to be the best audio or whatever. I can still get my text messages, but I can also turn off everything else. So, you don't. I think we all kind of know that feeling of like when you go out in your car and you go driving, you have no way. Like, what if I get a flat tire? Like that feeling of just being disconnected. Well, this is has the right amount of connectivity that I feel like safe is probably the bad word, but I can get in touch with people, but I'm not distracted. Like when I go to the gym, I just take my watch, leave the phone at home. And so it's only just me and my music and you no know, work emails. You can turn off, you know, granular control like that during those hours. Um, and so my wife actually and I kind of do a quasi challenge that there are motivational things for health, like steps and workout hours. And so like our personal goals this year are to try to close on the Apple Watch the ring every single month, which is just a health benefit. I mean, there's if you don't do it, it's not like Steve Jobs or somebody comes over and like smacks you. Uh, but it's a it, it's. It's a, just a different way to try to stay healthy. Like we know screen time is bad, so we can leave our phones down, be with the kid. We know our, if our family needs to get in contact with us, it can. Um, so I've been wearing an Apple Watch now for three years. And I thought I was much like you. I was very hesitant. It was actually my wife who encouraged me to get it. And she said, you know what? Get it. And if you don't like it, take it back in two weeks. But she goes, I think you're going to like it. And I was like, ah, whatever. And I, I, wear the, I take this thing more places than I take my phone now. Yeah, I mean, then that's the thing is it's sort of that connected but not tethered. I feel like the phone yeah, has sort of become this ball and chain where the watch is just, I wear a watch any every day anyway. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm an Iron Man guy. I love my Iron Man watch. I'll yep. always have one. It's capable. It's super convenient. But sort of just adding more information to that medium has already proven to me to be amazing. And I just hope a couple, again, a couple of these apps – my dad's elderly has, mm -hmm. you know, monitoring systems that that work with my phone so I can know where he's at and, you know, whatever um, was hoping that would flow right into the watch. Hasn't yet. Oh, well, you know, I just got to, I think, be a little bit patient. But interestingly, uh, took a call on my phone or my watch yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, picked it up on my watch, didn't even realize that that it would because I was in my car. I just assumed it would pipe through my car audio. Uh, started talking and then the speaker came through my watch and I was like, oh man. And so I switched to the car and they're like, oh, that other speaker was better. And I was like, you've got to be really? kidding me. Right. So, so that's the other thing is there seems to be a quality piece here that's coming up as well in the wearables. That's pretty, pretty awesome and exciting. Meanwhile, mm. you know, my, my uh, soon to be eight year old son is, has been nagging me for a watch. I got him one of those little, uh, just kind of single button phone home. Sure watches that is absolutely amazing as well right i mean mm -hmm. and and all everything that i dreamed of as a child is he's he's got <laughs> which is just unbelievable and there's more right as you pointed out uh and now he saw it he's like oh man so i i yeah, yeah. i kind of opened a, a bit of a can of worms here but it's it's a fun one right it's a really really cool and it fun is one. it's a so, it's a but, neat when used correctly it's it's a neat medium the nice thing is is when you're out and you only have your watch, you can't respond to an email. You can take a call. You can see messages. You can respond to text a little bit, but you're not writing emails. You're not going to be browsing the web. It really, it's just a nice way to quasi disconnect from mm -hmm. the world, but not be, not be stranded. Right. Shut off or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's a cool thing. So I'll uh, maybe, maybe update next month on yeah, how that curious. is going. <laughs> see, once the, once the shininess and the, the newness wears off to see yeah, if you yeah. still enjoy it as much. But I suspect that you'll, you'll find, cause it, 
it's so much easier just to look down at your wrist when you feel that vibration rather than pulling it out and yeah be the joker who's just constantly unlocking their phone yeah. and so yeah if i can just figure out how to side load so if anyone's got uh yeah. got any tips on on side loadification of these latest gen watches that would be welcome well there you go there you go well, Aaron, we very much appreciate your time stopping by today, talking quite literally rollback of updates to smartwatches, a little bit of everything in between. And uh, everybody else, thanks for tuning in. Make sure to hit the subscribe buttons and do all that good stuff that everyone always begs you to do on social. And uh, we'll be right back here next month with more Enterprise Dish. Have yourselves a wonderful day.